Travis O'Brien. Take a seat at the Volusia County Court where a 13-year child is about to be sentenced. This is Travis O'Brien, a pint-sized gunman who, along with his 14-year-old female pal, were armed with firearms and held a 35-minute shootout with police deputies in Florida. On June 1, 2021, 12-year-old Travis O'Brien and 14-year-old Nicole Jackson escaped from the Florida United Methodist Children's Home after Jackson allegedly hit a guard with a stick. Both kids then broke into a home on Enterprise Austin Road, Volusia County, where they found a shotgun and an AK-47. Following reports of the break-in, police deputies arrived at the scene, and what happened next was definitely what they had expected. Shooting out the rear window toward my direction. Stand by. Both kids armed with the firearms they found opened fire at the police officers who had to take cover behind surrounding trees. This shocking incident went viral after it was captured on police body cams and aerial camera on a helicopter. This standoff lasted for about 35 minutes with the deputies firing 66 rounds. It only came to an end after the police incapacitated Jackson, who aimed a loaded shotgun at deputies. Once O'Brien saw his accomplice was hit, he then stepped out of the house with his hands up in the air, indicating surrender. Jackson, who was hit in the chest and arm, was immediately taken to the hospital, while O'Brien was taken into custody, where he was charged with attempted murder of a law enforcement officer, burglary, and criminal mischief. My understanding is you want to enter our plea today? to resolve everything. A year after, O'Brien, now 13 years old, appeared in court on March 23, 2022, where he entered a no-contest plea and was sentenced to a maximum risk assessment program to be followed by conditional release. Jackson, on the other hand, was sentenced to 20 years in prison as part of a plea deal. Morgan Geyser and Anissa Wire take a seat at the Waukesha County Circuit Judge where Judge Michael Boren presides over a chilling case that involves two murderous kids who stabbed their friend 19 times to please a fictional character named Slender Man. On May 31st, 2014, during a game of hide-and-seek at David's Park near Waukesha, 12-year-olds Morgan Geyser and Anissa Wire suddenly pinned their friend and classmate Peyton Isabella Leutner to the ground and stabbed her 19 times. According to them, they had stabbed Peyton, whose nickname was Bella, following the Slender Man's instructions. After stabbing her, they told Peyton to lie down while they got help. However, they never returned. Peyton, who was stabbed in the arms, legs, and torso, with one of the stab wounds missing a major arm artery of her heart by less than a millimeter, managed to drag herself to the roadside where a cyclist found her and contacted 911. Is, are you with this 12-year-old female? Yeah, she says she's having trouble breathing. She said she was stabbed multiple times. Five hours later, following an extensive search, Geyser and Wire were found near Interstate 94 on their way to meet Slender Man at his mansion in Nicolet National Forest. Both girls were apprehended and confessed to the stabbing of Peyton. Following investigations, Geyser, who was deemed the mastermind, was charged with attempted first-degree homicide, while Wire was charged with attempted second-degree homicide. Both girls were tried as adults, and in 2017, Wire was sentenced to 25 years to life. Geyser, on the other hand, was sentenced to 40 years to life. Devin Shepard. Now let's head to Franklin in Indiana where a dramatic scene unfolds. A nine-year-old boy is being arrested after fighting another student and striking a teacher. On August 30th, 2017, police officers were called to the Needham Elementary School in Franklin, Indiana, following a fight that broke out between two fourth graders during recess. According to reports, nine-year-old Devin Shepard, who was autistic, had gotten into a fight with his classmate, and when a teacher tried to intervene, Shepard hit her. Just as police arrived at the scene, Shepard's father, Ronnie Shepard, was also called to the school. In a heartbreaking turn of events, the police proceeded to arrest the nine-year-old boy who could be seen sobbing as he was being handcuffed. He was charged with battery and criminal mischief. At some point in the video, Devin, who was still sobbing, was heard telling his dad, bye dad, love you, almost like he was never going to his father again. Love you, buddy. I'll be right there. The whole incident was captured by Ronnie Shepard, who began to record immediately he saw his son was being arrested and taken away. The video, which was later shared shared online sparked outrage among users, especially as the young Shepard was autistic and was said to have fought back in defense after he was bullied. Ronnie's father also confirmed that his son was being bullied at school and nothing was done even after he reported to the school's principal. I actually told the uh, principal and a lot of staff members here in, you know, in charge of recess or lunch about the bullying and they didn't take no steps to protect anything. While the local police department claimed that its officers followed proper procedure when they detained the boy Boy. Many who saw the video believed they went too far. Fortunately, Devin Shepard was only held for 20 minutes before he was released and all charges against were dropped.
Lionel Tate. She looks like she's not breathing. I tried to do CPR. Okay, is she, is she breathing or no? No, she's not. At the Broward County Circuit Court, the controversial sentencing of 13-year-old Lionel Tate is underway. The young boy was accused of murdering a six-year-old girl at his house. On July 29, 1999, six-year-old Tiffany Eunuch was brutally murdered by her playmate, 12-year-old Lionel Tate. On that fateful day, Tiffany was at Lionel's home after her mom, who was friends with Tate's mother, decided to drop her off. Both mothers had a routine where they would regularly help each other take care of the kids. After 45 minutes, Tate reported to his mom that Tiffany was no longer breathing. She immediately contacted Tiffany's mother and 911. By the time the six-year-old was rushed to the hospital, she was pronounced dead. An autopsy report revealed that she had a lacerated liver, a fractured rib, and a swollen brain. Her neck, legs, and feet were also seriously bruised, and these injuries were described as similar to those she would have sustained by falling from a three-story building. After investigations, it was found that Lionel Tate was her murderer. At the time, Tate was unusually large for his age and weighed 166 pounds. Tiffany, on the other hand, was quite small and weighed just 46 pounds. Investigation revealed that Tate had beaten her brutally, even though he claimed he had only been showing her professional wrestling moves he watched on TV. He was charged with the first-degree felony murder of Tiffany Eunuch and was tried as an adult. In 2001, Tate was convicted of the crime. A few days after his 14th birthday, the judge sentenced Lionel Tate to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Daniel Bartlam. Let's head to Nottingham Crown Court where 15-year-old Daniel Bartlam is about to be sentenced for the brutal murder of his mother. According to him, the murder was inspired by the soap opera Coronation Street, where a villain murders a woman with a hammer. Seat back as we delve into one of the most shocking cases involving a minor. On April 25, 2011, police were alerted to a fire outbreak at a home in Georgia Drive, Red Hill, Nottinghamshire. By the time police arrived, the body of a 47-year-old mother, Jacqueline Bartlam, was found. Thankfully, both her son 14-year-old Daniel Bartlam and his younger brother were unharmed along with their dog. However, police soon discovered the fire outbreak was no accident, as autopsy revealed Jacqueline Bartlam had died from head injuries. According to an initial statement from Daniel Bartlam, his mother had been killed by an intruder. However, he later retracted his statement saying he had killed his mother in a fit of rage following an argument. Investigations soon proved this to be a lie. Before the incident, Daniel was obsessed with violent video games and horror movies, spending most of his free time playing these games and watching scary shows. It wasn't long before he began to plot the murder of his mom after gaining inspiration from one of his favorite soap operas titled Coronation Street. One of the characters, John Stape, had brutally murdered a woman with a hammer. After examining his computer, detectives found a deleted story he wrote where a character named Daniel Bartlam had murdered his mother in the same way. He murdered his mother by hitting her on the head and face with a claw hammer seven times. Once he was done, he placed newspapers around her, poured petrol around her bedroom, and set the house on fire. We now know that Daniel Barlin planned to kill his mom. He then executed the killing in a violent attack on her. With the evidence against him, Daniel was arrested and on February 9, 2012, was found guilty of murder. The now 15-year-old Daniel was sentenced to life in prison to serve a minimum of 16 years before he was eligible for parole. Nicole Kip Miller. Next up, we have the case of Nicole Kip Miller, who is about to be sentenced at the Bay County Circuit Court after she murdered a baby. The child's remains were found in a commercial trash container behind a Bay County store. On December 10, 2009, 19-year-old Nicole L. Kip Miller gave birth to a male baby at her home in the 4,800 block of S. Flajol Road in Williams Township. Hours after the delivery, she went to the Mid-Michigan Medical Center in Midland, seeking medical attention. After examinations, the doctors determined that Kip Miller had recently given birth to a child. When they asked her where her baby was, she was reluctant to tell them, giving rather ambiguous answers about the baby's location. Bay County Sheriff's deputies were informed and a search for the infant commenced. In the early hours of December 11, 2009, deputies found the baby's remains in a commercial trash container behind the Miska's Country Market, which was just some distance from where Kip Miller lived. The body of the infant was placed in two plastic bags which were inside a cardboard box bearing her surname. Following this discovery, she was arrested on February 1, 2010, and upon interrogation, Kip Miller stated the child was still born, which contradicted the autopsy report that states the child was born alive. It was determined that the baby had died from asphyxiation. Prosecution charged her with second-degree murder, but on November 30, 2010, on the day her trial was to begin, Kip Miller pleaded no contest to involuntary manslaughter. Bay County Circuit Judge Joseph K. Sheeran sentenced her to serve 8 to 15 years in prison for the involuntary manslaughter 
manslaughter of her infant son, Mackenzie Shirilla. And in Strongsville, the trial for a teen accused of murder is underway. She was involved in a deadly crash last year when... Now we arrive at the Cuyahoga County Common Pleas Court, where sentencing is underway for an Ohio teenager accused of murdering her boyfriend and his friend by intentionally crashing her car against a wall. Let's look at the case of Mackenzie Shirilla and find out what the verdict will be. On July 31st, 2022, at around 5.30 a.m., the then 17-year-old Mackenzie Shirilla was captured on surveillance camera driving her 2018 Toyota Camry down a three-quarter mile road, speeding until she hit 100 miles per hour. Not long after, she crashed into the brick wall of a building. By the time police arrived at the scene, 20-year-old Dominic Russo, who was Shirilla's boyfriend and his friend, 19-year-old Davian Flanagan, was found dead. Shirilla surprisingly survived the accident even though the car was severely damaged. Investigation showed that the trio had smoked marijuana before Shirilla took the wheels, but the accident wasn't an unfortunate case of driving under the influence. Just weeks before the crash, Shirilla and Russo's relationship had become volatile, and the couple would often get into fights. At one time during a fight, she was overheard saying she would crash her car with Russo inside it. Once investigations revealed she had intentionally crashed the car, she was arrested and charged with multiple counts, including murder, vehicular homicide, and felonious assault. Surveillance footage played in the courtroom proved prosecutors right, as she was driving reasonably before picking up speed. She was found guilty of 12 counts, and on August 21, 2023, Judge Nancy Margaret Russo sentenced Shirilla to 15 years to life in prison for the murders of her boyfriend and his friend, saying she morphs from responsible driver to literal hells on wheels. Eric Smith. At Steuben County Court, 14-year-old Eric Smith is about to be sentenced for the horrifying murder of four-year-old Derek Joseph Roby. At the age of 13, Smith brutally murdered the four-year-old by strangling him and then smashing his head with a large rock. At 11 a.m. on August 2, 1993, Doreen Roby went to pick up her son, four-year-old Derek Joseph Roby, from the local park day camp in Savona, Steuben County. To her dismay, she was told that her son never arrived at the camp that day. She immediately contacted the police, and after four hours, Hours, the body of Derek was found in a nearby wooded area. The cause of his death was determined to be blunt trauma to the head, along with contributing asphyxia. While many were shocked at the murder of the child, what they didn't know was that the murderer was a 13-year-old boy named Eric Smith. On that day, Doreen couldn't take her son to the park, so she allowed him to go on his own. Smith was on his way to the same camp when he encountered Derek. He lured the child into a wooded area where he strangled him, placed a large rock on his head, and sodomized him with a stick. Smith became a prime suspect following his statement to investigators who were quite sure he might have had a hand in Derek's death. Six days after the body of Derek was discovered, Smith confessed to the murder to his family members. He was arrested, and on September 2, 1993, he was indicted with the second-degree murder of Derek Joseph Roby. He was to be tried as an adult at the Steuben County Court. So you find the defendant guilty of murder in the second degree? Yes. Is that unanimous? Yes. On August 16, 1994, the jury unanimously found 14 year old Smith guilty of second degree murder and he was sentenced to nine years to life, which was the maximum sentence for juveniles. Christian Fernandez. Christian Fernandez was just 12 years old when he killed his two year old half brother. According to our partners at the Florida Times Union, the toddler died from head injuries when Fernandez slammed him into a bookshelf in their apartment. Let's head to the fourth judicial circuit court where one of the most controversial cases is currently underway. 12 year old Christian Fernandez deemed the youngest person to be charged as an adult in the history of of Jacksonville is about to be sentenced for the murder of his half-brother, which occurred in March 2011. On March 14, 2011, two-year-old David Galarraga was left under the supervision of his older half-brother, Christian Fernandez, who had a history of violence at their Jacksonville home in Florida. While the details of what exactly happened is unclear, Christian, in a fit of anger, had slammed his half-brother's head into a bookshelf several times. When he saw the younger child was unconscious, he picked him up and laid him on the bed. When their mother, Bianella Susana, returned, Turned. Christian showed her the unconscious child, but instead of immediately dialing 911, she simply wiped the blood off his face, changed his clothes, and put ice on his head. She then surfed the internet for over seven hours before she eventually took the still unresponsive David to the hospital. Due to the severity of his injuries, which included a fractured skull, David died two days later. Fernandez was arrested and he confessed to murdering his brother. In June 2011, was indicted with aggravated child abuse, which was later upgraded to first-degree murder. In February 2013, Fernandez, who was tried as an adult, pleaded guilty to the lesser charge of manslaughter and aggravated battery. He was sentenced to serve seven years in juvenile jail. Daniel Marquez. Now happening at the Lee County Juvenile Court, 10-year-old Daniel Marquez is being sentenced after he was accused
accused of making a school shooting threat in May 2022. Let's find out what the case is about and what the verdict will be. In May 2022, 10-year-old Daniel Marquez sent several text messages to another 10-year-old, which included images of guns, money, and an ambiguous text that said, get ready for water day. The text messages were received by parents of the other child, and because they were sent just days after the Uvalde school shooting in Texas that left multiple people dead, it was a cause for concern. Therefore, they reported the incident to law enforcement officers who swung into action and arrested Marquez at his home. This arrest gained mass publicity after the Lee County Sheriff posted a video of Marquez's perp walk on Facebook. Although Marquez insisted he was joking about a scam and was only making reference to a school-sponsored event when he texted Water Day, he was charged and found delinquent of a second-degree felony. Delinquent of texting a violent threat is sentenced to probation. As we've been reporting for the past year, Daniel Marquez sent private texts to a friend, text he says were a joke about a scam involving money and guns, followed by a reference to a school event. Daniel was arrested, charged, and found delinquent at trial of a second-degree felony. At his trial in July 2023, Lee County Judge Carolyn Swift sentenced Marquez to probation, although she didn't say how long it would be. However, conditions of the probation included a 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. curfew, a diversion class, and an appearance before a neighborhood accountability board. Marquez was also asked to write a 500-word essay defining a school treat and what he had learned from his own case. Antonio Barbeau. Let's head to a Sheboygan County courtroom where 14-year-old Antonio Barbeau is about to be sentenced. The teenager was arrested and pleaded no contest to first-degree intentional homicide after murdering his 78-year-old grandmother with a hatchet. On September 17, 2012, 13-year-old Antonio Barbeau and his best friend Nathan Pape made their way to the apartment of Barbeau's great-grandmother Barbara Olson in Sheboygan. Unfortunately, this wasn't a friendly visit as the two had planned to rob and kill her. Once they got there, their unsuspecting victim welcomed them at the door, but as as soon as she turned her back, Barbeau struck her on the head with the blunt end of an hatchet. Pape, armed with a hammer, also struck her, and they continued until they were sure she was dead. The duo then robbed her and drove off in her car after leaving Olson's body in the garage. It wasn't long before the murder was reported, and officers went straight into investigation. They located her stolen vehicle, her purse, the murder weapons, and a school paper with the name Nate written on it. The police were able to trace the paper to Pape, and the murderous friends were arrested. Both boys were charged with first degree intentional homicide, to which Barbeau pleaded no contest to. On August 12, 2013, Antonio Barbeau, now 14 years old, appeared in court for sentencing. Just before he was sentenced, he tried to read a statement to the courtroom. There's a lot going around said by the news, DA, and many other people, that I'm a cold, heartless, care careless killer. And that's, that's not true. However, he broke into tears at some point and his lawyer had to read the rest of the statement. Despite this emotional moment, the brutal murder of Barbara Olson was inexcusable. For his role in her murder, Antonio Barbeau was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 36 years. Pepe was also sentenced to life in prison. Talon, still on kids who went to jail for crazy reasons, let's go all the way to Montgomery, Alabama, where a nine-year-old boy simply identified as Tylan is about to go to jail. His crime, he stole candy. Let's find out the details of this case and the outcome. Come on, man. Oh, I want to go to jail. No, sir. I'm sorry, sir. I'm sorry. A nine-year-old boy named Talon was arrested after his mother called the police on him. While the account of what happened varies, the popular consensus is that his mother caught him with a stolen candy bar. Immediately, she saw the candy bar. She threatened him, saying he was going to go to jail. Another account states that Talon was known to bully younger kids at a daycare and was generally a naughty child. His mother, having had enough of his attitude, decided to call the police on him. This seemed to have an effect on him. As soon as Talon saw the officers, he began to cry and beg his mother, telling her he was sorry repeatedly. At some point, he began to yell loudly, begging that he didn't want to go to jail as his hands were placed behind him. His pleas didn't stop the police from placing his hands behind his back and handcuffing him. Whether this was a lesson by Talon's mother to teach her son good behavior, his reaction to the presence of the police officers proves that perhaps she had taken the right steps. There was no further report on whether he was held in detention or released that same day. Whatever the case might have been, a nine-year-old going to jail for stealing candy and bullying is easily one of the craziest reasons why any child has to be arrested. 
Derek and Alex King take a seat at the Escambia County Circuit Court where sentencing for two young killers is currently ongoing. 13-year-old Derek and 12-year-old Alex King had brutally murdered their father while he slept in November 2001. Their trial and sentencing is deemed one of the most controversial cases to ever hit the nation. On November 26, 2001, Terry King was peacefully asleep when both his sons, Derek and Alex King, entered his room and beat him to death with an aluminum baseball bat. He was beaten so badly that his blood splattered 12 feet across the room. After they murdered their father, both boys decided to set their cantonment Florida home on fire just to conceal their crime. They then fled the scene to the trailer home of Ricky Chavis, a family friend who hid the boys and attempted to conceal evidence of their crime by washing the blood off their clothes. As soon as the remains of Terry King was discovered, investigators soon sensed foul play and decided to interrogate Derek and Alex King. At first, the boys claimed they murdered their dad because he often spanked them. Later, they changed their state statement saying they committed the murder because Cavus convinced them. At another point, they claimed Cavus actually committed the murder and convinced them to take the fall. Alex also testified that he had been having sexual relations with Cavus, who they claimed treated them better than their father. A trial was held for both King brothers who were tried as adults. In November 2002, both boys pleaded guilty to third-degree murder. Derek was sentenced to eight years in prison to be paroled after seven years, while Alex was sentenced to seven years with parole after six years. Florida girl. Finally, we head to Port Orange, Florida, where an 11-year-old simply identified as Ava is being arrested after prank texting 911 to report her friend's kidnapping. Let's find out how this drama unfolds for all involved. In July 2023, a dispatcher at the Sheriff's Communications Center received a text at 9.45 a.m. from an 11-year-old girl who claimed her 14-year-old friend had just been kidnapped. She told the text dispatcher that she was following both kidnapper and abductee in a blue jeep. For an hour and a half, she continued to send text updates some of them describing the alleged kidnapper, who she claimed had a gun. After tracking the cell phone used to send the text to the police, Volusia County deputies were able to locate her home in Port Orange. At 10.23 a.m., they arrived at the home where they met the girl later identified as Ava at home. According to her dad, she had been at home since morning. Upon further questioning, Ava revealed that the texts were a prank and that she had gotten the idea from a YouTube challenge, saying she thought it would be funny. However, police deputies were not having the joke at all, as she was handcuffed and arrested. Stay calm. You can talk to your parents. We can open the window and let you talk to them. Nothing's going to happen to you. Do you understand that? Okay. Body cam footage showed the police arresting her. At some point, they told the scared young girl to stay calm as nothing was going to happen to her, but they hoped she could use what had happened as a lesson. I'm telling you this right now. You're going to take this as a lesson at 11 years old that if you do something stupid in the future, you're going to enjoy those cuffs. I'm not going to do this again. She was charged with making a false police report concerning the use of a firearm in a violent manner, a felony, misuse of 911, and a misdemeanor. She was then transferred to the Volusia Regional Juvenile Detention Center, where she is set to appear before a judge in court soon. From the kid who was arrested for stealing a candy bar to those arrested for committing cold-blooded murder, this video of 15 kids who went to jail for crazy reasons shows absolutely no one is above the law, irrespective of your age. If you'd like to see more videos like this, click on the cards showing on your screen and I'll be waiting.